so it's a lot sturdier than the pans that go boing. We love our kitchen gear and gadgets, but over time, wear and tear definitely takes its toll. You can learn to fix or maintain your broken, dirty, or worn out gear instead of tossing it. Hannah and I are gonna show you some of our favorite solutions for repair and maintenance of your gear, so you can ultimately save money and keep that gear out of the landfill. First up, Lisa. First up, restoring the surface of a stainless steel skillet. We love our favorite stainless steel skillet. It is a great pan for browning and searing and sauteing, but it is not a nonstick pan by any stretch of the imagination. We've had people call us or write to us and say, I can't get my pan clean, is it ruined? And the answer is, no, it's gonna be fine. This stainless steel is really tough and durable, but what happens is when oil gets very, very heated, it breaks down into components that really bond and stick to this metal. So even when you use soap and water and you give it a little scrub with your sponge, you'll get the food out, but not that brownish cast that you can get inside and on the bottom of your pan. To get that really nice and clean and shiny again, we have Barkeeper's Friend. It's a powder and it was invented in the 1880s. A chemist was cooking some rhubarb in a tarnished pan and noticed that it made the pan really sparkly clean. And rhubarb contains oxalic acid. And that is the key ingredient of Barkeeper's Friend. It contains three things, oxalic acid, a mineral abrasive and surfactants. Surfactants are what are commonly in soap. To get your pan nice and clean, first you wanna get it wet and then you wanna sprinkle it pretty thoroughly with Barkeeper's Friend and then use either a scrub brush or the abrasive scrubby side of your sponge and just get in there and rub. You're gonna have a beautiful shiny pan again in no time at all. We love it for all kinds of stainless steel cleaning and really scrubbing tough messes and grime on your pan. This pan is not ruined, it is good as new. Next up, maintaining your coffee maker. There's two things that you really have to pay attention to with your coffee maker maintenance. One is coffee residue can get into the works and really turn rancid and coat the carafe and make everything taste a little bad and funky. The other thing is a hidden killer. Good tasting water has minerals in it that will deposit gradually on the inner tubes of your machine over time. When they're fully blocked, you can't do anything. That machine is dead. Descaling is gonna loosen that and remove it. If this coffee maker starts slowing down, that's when it's building up scale and those arteries are getting more and more clogged and it's more and more narrow for that water to pass through. If that's happening to your coffee maker, descale. So here's one trick that we have been told and we think is great. This is a pack of 100 filters. That's gonna be a couple of months, maybe, if you're making a pot a day. When that 100 filters runs out, descale. Or make a reminder on your phone that every couple months you should run a descaling cycle or anytime you see it slowing down. Some coffee makers, they will tell you to use white vinegar and water and run that through the machine. That works only to a certain extent and it can be kind of corrosive to the tubes inside your machine. It's too acidic, it's not really good for it, and it's not really fully effective. What's much better is to actually get a product designed for this. This is one by Ernex, it's called Descal. It works really well. You get a little box of these powder packets. The instructions are on here, it's very simple. 32 ounces of cold water, pour it in, no coffee, no filters, run it through the machine, and then when the craft is full and it's done, pour that out. Then run two to three cycles more where you fill this tank with clean water and run the brew cycle again. That will just flush out any remaining powder. It will take away any remaining scale that's been loosened by the powder. And this coffee maker will be ready to keep making you a good cup of coffee. Let's talk about cleaning the carafe. Your carafe can get pretty lined with old coffee residue. You just really wanna get that nice and sparkling clean again so it doesn't give your coffee an off flavor. We have a couple of great tricks for that. First, our good old bottle brush. This is our favorite from Quickie works really well, but to get that brownish residue off, sometimes that's not enough. You just want to use a dishwasher pod. If it's powder, you wanna cut it in half, or if it's a liquid one, you wanna slice it open and put it in with hot water 
leave it overnight, and in the morning when you rinse it out, it will be nice and clean and shiny and silver again, the way it should be. We love Dutch ovens in the test kitchen. We use them for tons of different kinds of recipes, but we also really love a light colored interior. This cream color is great because it puts light into the pot. You can judge the color of browning foods so you can keep it under control. That said, that light colored interior can get really discolored. So what do you do? So this pot is well used, a little bit worn, but it's still clean. It has a very long life ahead of it. If you've got a lot of browning and that enamel has turned quite brown and you can't wash it off with just soap and water, we have a few tricks for you. One is a bleach solution, one part bleach to three parts water. And you're gonna mix that and pour it in, leave it overnight, and in the morning it will lift off all that brown color. It will look beautiful, nice and light and ready to go. The other thing that can happen with your Dutch oven is that you weren't paying attention and burnt the heck out of something in this pot. Don't worry about it. You have not ruined your Dutch oven. You're gonna fill it halfway with tap water, put it on the stove. You're gonna let it boil for two or three minutes. Use a wooden spoon and just scrape away at anything that you can get at. After two or three minutes, take it off the stove, pour that water down the drain, let it sit for a couple of minutes because it will continue to soften the food that it's stuck on. You'll be able to wash it with just a sponge and hot soapy water and it will be nice and clean again and ready to go. We have dozens of stand mixers in the test kitchen for all of our test cooks to use when developing recipes. And we have to take care of them all the time just to keep them in top condition. There's a few things we've learned about maintaining and just taking care of your stand mixer to give it a much longer working life. First, you wanna run it pretty frequently. If you keep your stand mixer just for holiday baking and use it once a year, you may get a rude surprise. You may find oil dripping out of it if it's been stored and hasn't been used in months and months. That's because the motor up here really needs lubrication. It has grease in it, which is a thick black grease. It's food safe. But if it's undisturbed for too long, you can actually see it leaking out. Even if you're not going to use it, take it out every couple months, plug it in and turn it on and run it for about two minutes. You want to get that grease up into the gears and moving around because what will happen is the grease will settle out, it will drip out, and the gears will be dry, they will grind, and then that will be not good for your stand mixer. Two, if you've noticed your stand mixer isn't reaching the bottom and sides of the bowl, there's a really easy fix for it on most good stand mixers. So this is your beater blade and how low or high it sits in the bowl and how close it gets to the bottom is really key for it to reach all of the ingredients. You're constantly turning off the machine, scraping and turning it back on. It's gonna make everything take longer. It's not gonna mix effectively or efficiently. So look for machines like the KitchenAid and a few others that we've tested that have beater adjustability. And here's how you do it. What you need is the beater blade, the bowl, a dime, and a screwdriver, just flathead in this case. Open it up and look for a screw. The manual always will tell you where to go. And that is going to change the height of the attachment. So you can make it go higher or lower in the bowl. And one way to know if you've got it low enough is to use a dime. That is one sixteenth of an inch. You put that dime in there, and as the bit blade goes around, it should move it slightly on every complete circuit of the bowl. Not constantly, constantly is too close. And if it's not touching the dime at all, it's too high and you're gonna have a problem. You're not gonna move the um, screw dramatically, you move it like a quarter turn and check. If the beater blade is way too high, you will find that you can't lock the tilt head. It won't fully lock down and it'll wobble, so you won't be able to lock it. Okay, so now you've seen some of my favorite tips and tricks for keeping your kitchen gear in top shape. Let's go to Hannah for some of her favorites. We love making great pizza at home. And the best entry point to professional style pizza at home is a pizza steel or a pizza stone. Now we get tons of questions about these things. First of all, can you leave a pizza steel or stone in your oven? Yes, you can. It will act as a ballast, so your oven will be a little slower to heat up, a little slower to cool down. So if you're baking something really delicate, you might want to take it out, but otherwise it's fine to leave in there. Second, which is better, steel or stone? We have a slight preference for steels. It throws its heat a little more effectively into the doughs, resulting in really tender interiors, crispy exteriors. Now, onto cleaning. We get a ton of questions about these because if you've ever had one, they can kind of get looking messed up pretty quickly. We tested both of these for staining and you really can't get the stains out. 
So what you want to do is just scrape off any debris. You can use a bench scraper or a spatula or a scrub brush. You really do have to preheat these for an hour in the oven to get optimal results. After an hour at 500 degrees, these are going to be totally sanitized. So you don't have to worry about it being um, unsanitary in any way. But you do want to scrape the schmutz off so you don't get those burnt bits onto your pizza. Because these are two different materials, you have to care for them slightly differently beyond the scraping. So first here, the carbon steel. You essentially want to treat this like a carbon steel pan in some ways. If you do get it wet, you want to make sure to dry it off so it doesn't rust. Um, I found a little bit of rust is inevitable. You can clear away anything that's three-dimensional and oil it a little bit, just like you oil a carbon steel pan. This will just help seal up that surface. You know, you're not looking for the same non-stickability. You don't need to like warm and oil this after every use. This is more of a, an occasional maintenance thing, especially if you notice that your surface is getting particularly rusty. Now, over here, it's ceramic. It's a porous material, so it will suck up things like water and soap. So you never want to use soap on it because it will actually hold on to that soap and can transfer the flavor to your food. And also you want to really be careful around water because it sucks it up. If you put a wet pizza stone into a hot oven, it will crack. I've done this. It's a total bummer. When in doubt, follow these tips for pizza steels and stones. You'll be making some great pizza at home in no time. Another piece of equipment we get tons of questions about is the sheet pan or the rimmed baking sheet. This is probably one of our most core, most beloved pieces of equipment, but problems do arise. For example, they can get stained or darken over time. The other major issue we see is warping. Now you can see this pan in front of me is both of them. This is actually our winner from Nordic Wear, and I wanna make sure I get something out of the way first. All metal baking sheet pans are prone to warping. But if you choose the right brand, it will warp less. So one reason why Nordic Wear is our winner is it has this rolled reinforced edge. So it's a lot sturdier than the pans that go boing every time you put them in the oven. This will definitely warp less, but it is still possible for it to warp. So first up, staining or darkening. What do you do about that? I'm here to tell you not to worry about it it's actually not a bad thing if your pan darkens over time. So we noticed this anecdotally in the kitchen that the darker stained pans seem to be cooking things faster. So we ran a little experiment and attached temperature trackers to one brand new shiny sheet pan and one dark stained sheet pan. We put them into ovens that were set to the exact same temperature and recorded their temperature after 15 minutes. The darker pan was at 400 degrees, whereas the lighter pan was at 350 degrees. So it wasn't all in our head darker pans really do heat faster. And that means it will cook your food a little more quickly too. You'll actually get more gorgeous, better browning. There are a couple things you can do to prevent warping. First of all, don't put a hot pan under cold water. Let the pan cool down before washing it so it can contract gently and evenly. Second of all, try to cover the surface of the pan with food. If there are bare spots on the pan, those are going to get hotter faster than the parts where the food are, which can cause the pan to contract. Now, if you don't have enough food to spread across the surface of the pan, consider a smaller pan. This is a half sheet pan size. We absolutely love the quarter sheet pan size and the eighth of a sheet pan size of the same Nordic Wear pan. I honestly use the quarter sheet pan more than I use the big one. I use it all the time and love it. So what can you do if your pan is already warped? So what you wanna do is heat the warped sheet pan in a 200 degree oven for about 10 minutes until it's warm to the touch. Warming the pan up makes the metal a little bit more malleable, which allows you to return it to its original shape more easily. Then you wanna lay it upside down on a towel on top of a concrete floor or a wooden workbench. Lay another towel on top to protect it from scratching and then gently pound it with a mallet until the pan evens out. So many people throw these away if they're stained or warped. If you do have to buy a new pan, get a sturdy one like our winner here from Nordic Wear. It'll last a lot longer and it will warp a lot less. Next up, caring for wooden kitchen gear like wooden cutting boards, wooden spoons, and gear with wooden handles. Now let's start with cutting boards. Moisture is the enemy of wooden and bamboo cutting boards. The more water they absorb, the more prone they are to warping, which can lead them to splitting along their glue lines. Keep moisture away from your wooden cutting board. Make sure to dry it carefully after washing it and store it in a place where it gets some good air circulation. To keep your board looking great and to prevent it from splitting, 
your wood and bamboo cutting board should be seasoned before use. Now, some of them will arrive seasoned, but it's no problem if yours doesn't. We like to use spoon butter or board cream, a mixture of beeswax and mineral oil that you can either make at home or purchase online. Using a clean cloth, make sure you buff your board all over, front, back, sides, feet if they're wood or bamboo as well, Cover the whole thing completely, then let it sit for 24 hours and wipe off any excess. Sometimes one coat is sufficient enough to seal off your board. Sometimes you need several coats. If you drip water on top of the board and it beads up, that's how you know your seasoning is good to go. If the water still sinks in, you're gonna wanna apply another layer of seasoning. You do wanna stay away from using something like olive oil or a cooking oil to oil your wooden or bamboo cutting boards because they can go rancid and your board will start to smell. Mineral oil or board butter, spoon butter with mineral oil in it won't go rancid in the same way. This board I have in front of me is pretty dry. You can see knife marks here. Anytime you see your board starting to dry out like that, it's a good idea to oil it. I have right here, our winning board from Teak House, which you can see is in beautiful shape. Look at this luster. This is an absolutely gorgeous board. It has a unique quality, you know, made from teak. Teak has tectoquinones in it, which means it actually oils itself. You still wanna oil your board, but because of those tectoquinones, boards made from teak will retain more moisture. Now let's talk about wooden spoons. I have three quite dry examples right here. This is another product we get a lot of questions on. We've heard of some folks talk about boiling wooden spoons to get rid of stains and smells, we really want to caution folks against this. This is a natural substance. If you boil it, you're going to expand it. Then as it dries out, it will contract again. This is going to lead to further drying out, possibly cracking. What we do recommend is washing them with soap and water and then drying them after use. If you notice that your wooden spoon is starting to look a little dry, you can also coat it with mineral oil or board butter and leave it to dry overnight and then remove the excess in the morning just to prevent cracking and keep your wooden spoon looking gorgeous for longer. With these tips, we hope to help you keep your kitchen equipment up and running and looking its best for a long time to come. For more information, check out the links below or go to americastestkitchen.com. Do you have any cleaning, care, or maintenance tips for us? Let us know in the comments. Make sure to like this video and hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode.